In a previous video, I made some nice Prussian blue pigment, and I showed how it can be used to color things like paint. This time though, I'm going to be exploring a more specialized use for it, which is in a process called cyanotype. In this process, the Prussian blue is formed directly in paper, and it was classically used to make blueprints. Over the years, many different formulations were used and developed, but the most popular one uses potassium ferrocyanide and a UV-sensitive iron compound called ferricomonium citrate. As far as I know, there's no safe and reasonable way to make the ferrocyanide, so I ended up just buying it from eBay. It was possible to make the ferricomonium citrate though, starting from the ferric chloride that I made in the last video. It was honestly really hard to find a procedure for this, and the only decent one I found was from the 1950s. I ended up downscaling it and altering a couple things, but in my opinion, it still worked out really well. I've included a link to the original procedure for those of you who want to check it out. Anyway, the goal of this video was to make this new iron compound and to test it out by trying to make my own blueprint. I'll also talk about the chemistry behind the whole process, which I think is really cool. In terms of chemicals, I'll be using ferric chloride, sodium hydroxide drain cleaner, ammonia solution, and citric acid. I made the ferric chloride from scratch in my Prussian blue video, starting with acid and steel wool. If you're interested in seeing how I did that, there's a link in the description. The citric acid and sodium hydroxide drain cleaner were purchased locally, but I got the concentrated ammonia solution online. In hindsight though, I probably could have just used ammonia cleaner from the store. The first thing that I had to do was make a strongly basic solution of sodium hydroxide. So into a beaker, I added 100 mls of water, followed by 25 grams of the sodium hydroxide, and I stirred it until everything dissolved. By the end, it was still a bit cloudy, but that was just because of air bubbles. For the moment, I put it on the side, and I moved on to making the next solution. I poured in 200 mls of water and added 50 grams of the iron chloride. Then I turned on the stirring and waited for it all to dissolve. About 20 minutes later, there was still a bunch of solid stuff floating around, but it wasn't really worth filtering it. So I just moved on to the next step, which was to react it with the sodium hydroxide solution that I made a couple minutes ago. I added it slowly over the course of about a minute, and a lot of dark iron-3 hydroxide formed. This form of iron was practically insoluble in water, so it immediately precipitated out. As a side product, this reaction also made sodium chloride, but that just stayed dissolved in solution. I continued stirring it for about an hour just to make sure that it all reacted, and then I let it sit overnight. By the morning, the iron hydroxide had settled out a bit, and the solution was completely colorless, which told me there was little to no iron chloride left. The next step was to filter it off, but first, I just poured off as much of this excess water as I could. Then the rest of it was added to a coffee filter. I then washed the beaker and the iron hydroxide with a whole bunch of distilled water. This was done to help get rid of any sodium chloride that might still remain, as well as unreacted sodium hydroxide. I let it sit there for several hours, but it was still quite wet. This was perfectly fine though, and I just transferred all the paste to a beaker. Getting it off the filter paper was honestly kind of a messy process, but I managed to get pretty much all of it. I then moved on to making another solution. So to a beaker, I added 50 mls of water and 23.1 grams of citric acid. I turned on the stirring, and when it all dissolved, I tested the pH. The red color told me that it was highly acidic, which made sense considering it was a solution of citric acid. The next step was to neutralize the citric acid by adding just enough concentrated ammonia solution. I wasn't exactly sure beforehand how much I needed though, because the concentration of my ammonia wasn't very exact. So I just had to add it in small portions and regularly check the pH. Citric acid has three carboxylic acid groups, and it can therefore react three times with ammonia. Each carboxylic acid group isn't equal though, and they all have different acid strengths. So, as the ammonia was added, it first reacted with the strongest group, then the second, and finally the third. By the time the pH was neutral, or just slightly basic, there was no citric acid left and it was all in the form of ammonium citrate. This solution was then added to the iron hydroxide paste. 
From this point on, things started to become light sensitive, so I worked mostly in the dark. I only turned the lights back on when I needed to film something. I turned on strong stirring and heating, and I boiled it for about 10 minutes. I did my best to try to knock down some of the stuff that was stuck to the sides, but it didn't really work too well. In any case, after my attempt, I let it boil for another 5 minutes, so now for a total of 15. Then, because I wasn't able to clean this one up, I transferred it to another beaker. I tried to wash the original one with some water, but there was still a small amount of the hydroxide left in it. It was probably no more than a couple grams though, so I just counted it as a loss. By this point, the color of the solution was pretty much the same as it was when it started, but all the hydroxide had completely dissolved. This happened because the ammonium citrate had reacted with the iron hydroxide to make a water-soluble complex. The complex was some sort of mixture of iron-3, ammonium, and citrate, but that's all I really know. I really don't have any details about its structure or formula. I brought it back to a hard boil, and I added 2.4 mils of the concentrated ammonia solution. Then, I let this boil for another 90 minutes. It was important to keep the volume constant here, and I used a piece of paper to mark the height. I just checked it every 5 or 10 minutes or so, and added more water when needed. After the 90 minutes, I dumped in another 23.1 grams of citric acid, and a green precipitate appeared. I'm honestly not exactly sure what the precipitate was, but I know that in this step, I was forming the final ferric ammonium citrate complex. The final composition of the ferric ammonium citrate can vary a lot, but this one should be between 14 and 16% iron, and have about 1.5 moles of citric acid for every mole of iron. There's another form of ferric ammonium citrate, which is the brown form, and it has a higher iron content and usually more ammonia. Allegedly, the brown color comes from colloidal iron oxide floating around, so it's not really ideal for making cyanotypes. In general, the green form is preferred, and it's why I chose to make it here. This was boiled for another 60 minutes, and I again kept the volume as constant as possible. Over the hour, the precipitate slowly disappeared, and I was eventually left with a very dark green, nearly black solution. I quickly vacuum filtered it to get rid of any solid material, and I transferred it back to a beaker. I also re-added the stir bar, and turned on some strong stirring. I tested the pH and saw that it was around 3 or 4, so I adjusted it with ammonia until it was around 6. The next thing that I had to do was concentrate it by boiling off some of the water. I got rid of a bunch of it, and then to make things easier, I poured it into a smaller beaker. Then I kept evaporating it until it got to a volume of about 150 mils. At this point, I took it off the hot plate and poured it into a dish to evaporate. Off screen, I set up a fan to speed it up, and this is what it looked like the next day. It generally had a really glassy look, and the surface was a little wavy. What I thought was kind of cool though, was that when I blasted it with the fan, it completely smoothed things out. The surface seemed to be completely dry, and it was probably preventing the rest of the water from evaporating. So I bought some scrapers, and I tried to push it all into one big blob. It was surprisingly resistant though, and it took a lot of effort. I then put it in my oven at around 60C, and occasionally poked at it. I think it took a couple hours, but it was eventually completely dry. It was all crusted onto the dish though, and it took me like 20 minutes to scrape it off. However, even with all that effort, there was still a bunch that was just impossible to remove. To find out how much was left behind, I added exactly 10 grams of water and used it to dissolve everything. I then poured it into a beaker and weighed it, and the final mass was 19 grams, so 9 grams was still on the plate. I was honestly really surprised by that, and I expected it only to be a couple grams at most. My final yield of dry ferric ammonium citrate was 47 grams, and it looked like some sort of plant material. I broke apart a couple pieces, and the inside was really shiny and highly crystalline, which I thought was kind of cool. To see if this were actually ferric ammonium citrate, I could have run some random chemical tests. However, I figured it would be a lot more fun to just try cyanotyping with it. To do this, I needed to make two solutions.
Into the beaker on the left, I added 2 grams of the ferricomonium citrate, and in the one on the right, I added 1.4 grams of potassium ferrocyanide. Also, to each of them, I added 10 mils of distilled water, and I swirled them until everything dissolved. Then, the two solutions were mixed together. There's no reaction going on here, but it allegedly creates an emulsion, which means it's a fine dispersion of one solution in the other. I tried finding a source that told me exactly what was happening here, but I really couldn't find anything. If any of you guys have info though, I'd love to hear about it in the comments. I added a small amount of the mixture to a piece of printer paper, and I quickly used a brush to spread it out. One important thing to mention is that this entire preparation is sensitive to UV light. Working under the common artificial lights found in most houses seems to be okay, but it needs to be kept far away from strong sources of UV, like sunlight. In any case, when I was done coating it, I put it somewhere dark to dry, which usually takes a couple hours. While I waited for it to dry, I moved on to making a template. To do this, I just needed a thin sheet of transparent plastic, and the only thing I had around the lab was a plastic bag. It was far from ideal, but it was more than fine to just test things out. Using scissors, I cut off the edges, and I separated it into two sheets. Then I started drawing on one of them, just using a sharpie. I was originally planning to just make a flower, but I ended up adding my channel name. I didn't at all plan this drawing out beforehand, and I was honestly really happy with how it turned out. When it was done though, the lines in the flower weren't very dark, so I just went over them again with the sharpie. At this point, the template was done, but I still had to wait an hour or so for the treated paper to dry. When it was ready though, I just put it on a piece of glass and placed the template on top. I flattened it out as much as I could, and then I sandwiched everything between another sheet of glass. This was placed in direct sunlight for about three and a half minutes, and the color slowly changed. The reason this happened was because exposure to UV light catalyzed the degradation of the ferricomonium citrate. It caused the citrate group to donate electrons to the iron, reducing it from iron 3 plus to iron 2 plus. This of course only happens in the places that are exposed to UV, and the parts that are covered by Sharpie should remain unreacted. One last thing to mention is that the other component, potassium ferrocyanide, isn't really affected by sunlight, and it's really only the ferricomonium citrate that's reacting here. Anyway, after three and a half minutes, I covered it again and took it inside. I removed the glass and the template, and you can see the light spots where the Sharpie was blocking things. At this point though, the process wasn't done yet, and to finish things off, I had to put it in some water. So I dropped it in, and I was really happy to see that a nice blue color appeared, which was Prussian blue forming in the paper. This reaction only happened when the paper was wet, because it allowed the iron 2 plus ions that I made to come into contact with the potassium ferrocyanide. This led to the formation of Prussian blue, which is a mixed iron 2 plus and iron 3 plus pigment. The places that the Sharpie covered still had undegraded ferricomonium citrate, which was in its iron 3 plus state. This has no reaction with the potassium ferrocyanide, so in these spots, the chemicals just dissolve into the water and get washed away. I quickly dried my beautiful cyanotype with some paper towels, and then I left it out for a few hours. I scanned it when it was dry, and this was the final result. It was honestly a really low quality cyanotype, but I was still happy with it considering I made it using generic printer paper, a sharpie, and a plastic bag. Anyway, this was mostly just a proof of concept and to make sure that I actually made the ferricomonium citrate. My process though was actually very similar to how blueprints used to be made. The original design was made on a transparency and this was sent to a blueprinting company. The company then did pretty much the same thing as me, but with a lot better materials and a lot more precision. This whole industry kind of died though, when newer and more efficient printing techniques were developed. Nowadays, cyanotypes mostly done for artistic reasons, and I think it can be a lot of fun. I've decided to make one last video for this series, where I'll go into a lot more detail about the process, and I'll show how I used it to develop my own digital photos, as well as a couple photos sent to me by fans. I'm going to do my best to get it out within the next week, so definitely keep an eye out for it. As usual, a big thanks goes out to all my supporters on Patreon. Everyone who supports me can see my videos at least 24 hours before I post them to YouTube. 
Also, everyone on Patreon can directly message me, and if you support me with $5 or more, you'll get your name at the end like you see here.